We're recording there. So we're on. We're on. Right. We're on. Josh, mate, absolute pleasure. Glad yeah. we could tie in the um the, the crazy schedules, mate. I, I have no doubt yours is probably as crazy as mine. Yeah, man, it's been nonstop coming over. And you're, and you're flying back tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah, yeah. Tomorrow morning. So, um, what's, what's tomorrow morning? Yeah, yeah. Mate. Well, mid-afternoon. Is your missus over? Yeah, yeah. I've just... You've been there for the day. Yeah, Last mate. day in the UK on the holiday, you've been there. I've just been seeing all the lads. <laughs> <laughs> what else is there to do? Uh-huh. You got kids? No. No, okay. That's, that's, that's something. That's one less thing that we haven't had a go at. About, yeah, yeah. You know. Going to bed with the kids. Last day of the holiday. Yeah. You know, I'm going to do a podcast. I haven't seen the lads for years. Just <laughs> watch them. <laughs> um... Give me your background, if you don't mind, is it brief overview or whatever you want, to, but especially with the military side, just so people can get a feel of. Yeah, so you. Yeah, um, guess growing up, came came from Canada, grew up all over Canada, uh, real adventurous sort of kid type thing. Had some trips overseas when I was younger, kind of really sparked that adventure. Um, about seventeen, eighteen, I wanted to join the Canadian military. Took ages to get in and I was just getting annoyed with it so what was taking what was why was the length of time just the recruiting process oh really past everything and they were I couldn't get a date to join sort of thing um and I know a couple of other Canadian lads that came across and joined same issues and uh kind of knew about the core Royal Marines from reading World War II history and stuff uh found out I could join and I thought yeah I'll take a bit of that so 2005 came across Joined up, did training, had a blast. Huge culture so- shock coming from the U- coming from Canada to the UK. Couldn't understand anyone, and then getting thrown straight into the military. Um, yeah, did six years in the Corps total. Bounced around a couple places. Um, went outside, kind of mid to end two thousand eleven. Did a bit of security work for fourish years. Was living in South Africa at the time. Uh, oh. Yeah, whereabouts? Durban. So, okay, cool. Yeah, southeast. I'm right. How are you from? Yeah, right now I'm living in uh, Western Canada, so east side of the Rocky Mountains in the province of Alberta. Okay. Yeah, Calgary's my closest city, just in a small town. Are you in the city or in town? No, or? small town. town. Yeah, it's about three and a half thousand people. Just chill, really chill. Never thought I'd be back there and wanted to chill out. Yeah. So uh, moved back to Canada in 2014. Did that. Um, was always a climber. I started climbing when I was about 16. And I climbed on and off uh, up till about 2014. And, uh, what age were you joined? Uh, 19. Or 18 and a half, 19 okay. type thing, yeah. And then uh, 2014, yeah, went back. Struggled, kind of trying to find a job, all that sort of stuff. Um, big, really big culture shock. Big transitional period. Uh, after oh. after the security, yeah. So out in the security, back to Canada, trying to do your normal life, mate. I, I, that sounds like me. Yeah, yeah. Same, exactly the same thing. Go yeah, on. and then uh, just thought, okay, I'm just gonna go climbing. Had a couple like crappy jobs and that. Just got threaders with it, so uh, just climb full time. Lived in the back of a truck, like a lot of climbers do. They call them dirt bags. Just yeah, it is, mate. Basically on hard routine, summer and winter. <laughs> Uh, rock climbing, big wall, free climbing, uh, ice climbing, mixed climbing, your alpinism, alpine routes, and then sort of traditional mountaineering, as it were. Uh, so I did that on and off. Had a blast. Met a lot of interesting people, you know, just getting after it. Um, loved it. It was like freeing feeling, but really challenging. Uh, working up to more of the harder routes that I did. There was a lot of like logistics into it. It was really kind of militaristic in its approach, you know, a lot of organizing preparation. Uh, 2016, I was out on the west coast of Canada, uh, Squamish. It's about an hour north of Vancouver. Big, huge granite walls. Um, I spent a lot of time out there in the summer, just crack climbing, you know, that style of climbing in the granite. And uh, had an accident, fell 65 feet, straight down you free climbing no i was doing um a style of climbing called rope soloing so it's where you climb and manage all the rope work yourself um don't remember what happened 
fell 65 feet, main injury, broke my spine completely, shifted off, full sever of the spinal cord. Yeah, so I've been living in a wheelchair ever since. Okay. So that was in uh, June 2016, June 12th, 2016. Did about, um, yeah, about eight months in a hospital. You were on your own, were you? Yeah, well, there was a couple other people that uh, came up. So came when you- that day. When you're leading it, you're, you're putting the you're putting the carabine. You're putting the I don't know the I don't yeah. know the phrase in the geology. So you put the carabine, get the get the ropes in you, and, and so mm-hmm. and obviously is uh, see obviously uh, there must be like a a gap between you between the the next strong point down that you're attached to and the next one up. Yep. So how it, was the fall so far? Why was it sixty five feet? Yeah. Fuck it out. Right? So, yeah. So sixty five feet was the top of the climb. So coming coming a um, couple months after my injury, I got an email. From someone who saw me fall, and uh, she said I was at the top of the climb, organizing all the ropes and stuff. So it's a lot of gear for this style of climbing. So I guess I was at the top, organizing everything, and then she just saw me chucking her down. You blacked out. I can't remember it. That yeah. stranger, mate. And that, that is uh, fucking hell. Yeah, my. You know, I might woke up in hospital. Mate, yeah. Uh, waking up in a hospital was horrendous. Like. Man, it was it was crazy. So I did about two weeks in intensive care unit, and I did a month in total in Vancouver before I flew back to Calgary. Um, yeah, that two weeks, like my brain went back to the probably the last bit of trauma and stress that I experienced in my life, and that would have been Afghan. So I woke up or some, gained some sort of consciousness, and I hadn't a clue what was going on. Man, I Literally thought, no idea. No, not a clue. And that first month, I really didn't have a clue. It's very vague memories of people coming to visit me and stuff. But especially that first two weeks, what what, what, I, what I gather is two weeks. Um, like my brain reverted back to being an Afghan. And I honestly thought I was captured by the enemy. Um, my brother actually came right away. He saw me like absolute tripping out type thing. Like, I remember kind of waking up and just hearing voices. My eyes were covered, hearing voices, and I didn't, I had no idea what was going on. Why were your eyes covered? I don't know. Maybe just the lights, or maybe the lights were off, or whatever. Yeah. Or maybe I just couldn't Oh, just what you remember. You remember you think your eyes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm hearing voices, and so abnormal of what's going on. So I thought I was, like, captured. You know, my brain was so far gone, either through the drugs and the trauma that I've been in. Um, you know, multiple surgeries and all this. And, and then I passed out and then I kind of regained consciousness again. And I was thinking like, I got to get out of here. Like, <laughs> got to e and myself out of here, you know? And I guess that's when I was like starting to pull cords out and trying to grab nurses and screaming. Like, I was just going like, my brother saw me just, just fucking kill me. Let's get it over with. You know, like, mate, I'd never been so scared in my life. Like, Thinking you're captured by the Taliban. Pretty much, like that's where my brain went back to, and then you know I'd pass out and I'd just f- fall back into just like the darkness, you know, just brain just on overdrive. So I actually had to be restrained in the bed. So you know I'm waking up and I I can't move. I don't know what's happened to me and tripping, you know, like Jesus Christ. And then that kind of faded off, just kind of trickled away when I started, you know, seeing family and kind of piecing it together within that first month. So, yeah, it was pretty, pretty horrendous. And then I flew back to, uh, got flown back to Canada. The Canadian Legion actually helped me out with a medical flight. Somehow they heard about, heard about my injury and they're like, yeah, we need to get him back home so he can, you know, do his rehabilitation and everything like that near his family. We can organize, start helping him out. So they squared that away. <clears throat> Big help. I didn't know that they helped um, Commonwealth veterans. So they do a lot of work with Commonwealth vet, vets that are living in Canada. So yeah, I went back to um, the hospital in Calgary, close to my home, and started all my rehab, rehabilitation and learning how to live in this new new world I'm now in. Right. I, uh, I, <laughs> one of the things that um, I've, when I've thought about you know, people like yourselves when have gone through those unfortunate instances and 
and have gone through life changing, you know, injuries, and you can't. Uh, I don't suppose you can get anything more life changing than yeah. like paralysis or like blindness and, and, and yeah. stuff, you know, or something that similar way. One of your senses or one of your movement abilities is completely taken away, or like um, amputees, you know. Yeah. Um, is oh man, what 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 the mental journey is like when you when you when you're able to when you realize what's happened to you and what you know and your in what your injuries are mm-hmm. and how so successful people like yourself like um mickey yule who's been on as a double amputee you know how you what the mental process initially the, the struggle was like and the arguments in your head was, was like to be able to get through the if the question ever arises, I mean, yeah, it's like, what, what, why should I be? Here? Yeah, everything's gone. That's because that's potentially perceived. Everything's gone. What my life has been ripped away. What's the point in, con- in continuing? You know, yeah. uh, early on, I'm saying, mm-hmm. and how how do people get through that? What was it like when? Uh, so, so my question to you is, what when you you you, you came out with the that sort of frenzy of thinking you were captured by the Taliban, you know, um. What was it like when you realised that you you know you you're paralysed? What was that that mentally? I mean, how what was it, what was it like? Explain explain it to me. Yeah, I I didn't really come to full grips of it, I guess, um, till a little while after when I started having to you know do start doing the work, doing the rehab and stuff because I was just laying in bed you know but there really wasn't anything going in my going on in my mind it was like almost a blank slate as it were and then I remember seeing a um, x-ray of my spine you know saw tons of x-rays and just seeing how shifted it was I knew instantly like there was no coming back from that what did it look like what did the spine look like Uh, just kind of sorry my balance is bad just broken off like so it just, it just yeah, you get just two of the vertebrae completely misaligned. Pretty like, much just sitting, up, sitting off of each other, and then I saw the. I think I've got twelve screws in my back and two huge rods, you know. And then I started going through the list. They started going through the list of injuries that I had sustained from the fall, and I just, I'm like, okay, you're pretty lucky, you know. I thought about that, and then I started thinking about. I really thought about like all the lads that had gone through, you know, injuries in Afghan or after or whatever, and how how they just cracked on, you know, type thing, what they've been doing. I was like, okay, I've got this. Um, people started visiting me when I was in hospital who had been in chairs for a while. A lot of them were para-athletes and stuff and uh, told me what they were up to and introduced me to a couple different sports even when I was in hospital. And I just thought, okay, you basically have no excuse now type thing. So that sort of transition, I didn't really have, I I didn't give myself time to just sit and stew, you know, and just start following back. You know, it was like, here's a path you got. Let's take it. It's right here. There's no excuse. You know, I saw a lot of people in the hospital because it was in like a spinal neural ward rehab ward so a lot of brain injury spinal injuries and i saw a lot of people just switch off you know just fall into like depression rightly so you know but i i I saw that and i i didn't want to be part of it you know i did didn't want to tap into that because who knows how how bad it could get type thing there was another young guy about my age also spinal injury from a climb got injured like a month after me and he was just hyperactive dude you know so i was just we were just feeding off each other so that that quick progress almost made this transition feel seamless after injury and going into my mind really it was just like almost like that just utter determination like you you can't quit like just plow forward plow forward you know obviously there was days and there still is like laying in bed and it's just like 
I don't want to get out of here, especially within like the first year of being out of hospital. It was tough. Big transition, you know, having to learn how to do all this stuff alone and f- figure things out and complications and whatever, whatnot. You were, were you with your missus then or not? No, no, no. I met her about, uh, for, well, pretty much right after my injury type thing. But, you know, I had a great family around me, great support. Lads were coming to visit me, support me. Also, this, like, kind of new community I got thrown into with the Paris sports and, you know, huge benefit. It's just everything was just fell into place, as it were. So made it feel seamless. So, so what year was the injury again? Sorry, 2016. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, three, three and a bit years ago type thing. Yeah, I think <clears throat> um, when we were talking off air before, and you were, we were talking about the, um, the cycling, the para, Paralympic, pa, Paralympic, para, paracycling. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I, something popped into my head where I think <clears throat> there's a lot to be said for, <clears throat> I think that now the impact of the, the, the psychological benefits of sports yeah. to people are much, much greater now than I think they were before. Um, when I say before, I mean before smartphone and social media. I, mm. that's, that's exactly what I mean. I mean before that, so like pre, uh, well, the epidemic, should we say, so pre yeah. 2010, 2011. Yeah. And I, I, and I really start bringing it up now. I wonder if, I wonder if some of their help was, um, w- with the with the Paralymp- uh, I keep saying Paralympic, mm-hmm. Olympic, sorry, mate, Paralympic one day maybe. Let's uh, do it. The para- yeah, the the paracycling and the sports. Is that maybe? Uh, is that uh, no doubt? That must have been a, 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 a huge. I'm not saying you're a social media flipping mentalist before, but that impact on your positive impact on you must have, must be huge. And, and again, I go, I go back to Mickey Yule, I think as well, just to reference him as another athlete, yeah, like yourself. That switching off, focusing on something, taking your mind away from anything, going and getting and getting medieval again, and, mm. you know, medieval yeah. and driving the body forward and driving the mind. To achieve things that you, you, you that weren't possible before, yeah. that will be possible if you if you if you strive towards them and you'll you'll get to a point. You know, I don't know. Hundred like, percent. Like I talk when I speak to people, or you know, I talk about you know, I just I pretty much just took all the energy and focus that I had before. I realized there's no coming back from this short of a miracle. Let's take what you got and let's just switch it into something else and yeah 100 percent. if i didn't have that and i wasn't you know I'd, I'd be like well where's my life go now you know because everything i did was before was very physical very focused and i personally need that you know it's the type of person i am so that aided in that transition you know i started cycling three months after my accident pretty much Oh, really? Yeah, I joined like a recreational group. So those athletes that came and visited me kind of pointed me in this like recreational group of hand cyclists that met. So I went out with them on the road, just ripping around the neighborhood sort of thing. Met my first cycling coach there, and he invited me to come train with him. So three times a week I'd go after my like physiotherapy and rehab, just learning how to use a wheelchair, or flop around on a bed, get dressed. And then I started training with him, you know. I could barely try, you know, barely turn my arms over. But, you know, even there, I was seeing like young lads, like 12, 13, training on um, like a regular road bike. You know, maybe he has some sort of deformity in his arm or maybe spina bifida or something. I can't remember. And I'd see this kid like just hammering it for like two hour sessions, working hard. And I was just like, mate, you've got no excuse. Like, keep going. And I I needed that. Just to even after even though I was so physically drained from you know all these surgeries and learning how to live in this new body, I still needed just to get physically drained. And that needed to get emotionally drained as well. Like just strip draw again. Let's go. Build up again. In in a way, in a strange sense i felt like i no, do that it makes sense i mean <clears throat> there's people you know a lot of people that comment to you and i from our, our background um 
I mean, military background is com- there's a lot of common traits that come with people like that, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm generally speaking, it's not every person who's mm-hmm. different. You know, different yeah. we're, we're, we're driven. We 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 want to get somewhere. We may not know where that is. We want to su- uh, yeah. yeah. We want to succeed, especially when we want to succeed. We're gonna go somewhere. We believe in ourselves. Like and achieve this, you know, because uh, because <coughs> I mean, uh, just one one example of why that's the case and that general, you know, sort of general traits that I'm talking about yeah. good yeah general traits that I'm talking about are um are because yeah uh, uh, because little things like to get into the Royal Marines to get into the powers to get into the military to get into flipping even the even the RAF right yeah <laughs> maybe not the RAF you gotta you gotta you gotta achieve mental and physical you have to make mental and physical achievements just to yeah. get your foot in the door just even with the chance of looking at you know getting just, to the recruit just you know, making that commitment training, right yeah so so you stray away that kind of person and then when a catastrophic incident happens you know like yourself perhaps i'm not saying it's you but you know that you got you 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 maybe at a point where it's like how do i shit everything i knew i was capable of and i was going to move in towards and, and i could move towards and, be, and succeed and yeah, like be a climbing or be a you know find a job, whatever. It's just, it's all changed, and then you know you get into things like you know, sports, and it you you realize ah, I can do I can do something. You know, yeah. so sort of, I was a moron. Yeah, like, I'm, 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 it's like a lousy shit. It's not like it's yeah. like it's that it's it, it's an it's a it's a it reminds me of a, a thing in, in, that I've uh, tried to. Um, understand it was presented to me by a counsellor in the past and it's you're a different I'm, granted nothing like you I'm talking yeah. a, a me, my mental state now yeah. is not what it was before mm-hmm. and it's and, and it's looking at it as in I'm not the person I was before I can't achieve that it's I, I can't achieve what I want to achieve it's there's been a change now let's analyse the change what can I do and how can I be the best person I can be I, I'd say it's but, it's similar for yourself, right? Yeah. And look at what everything that sport brings brings with it as well. Mm-hmm. You, your community, it's new knowledge, it's a new community of like-minded individuals. Yeah. It's uh, focus, determination, the crack, camaraderie, you, you know. It's, All uh, that stuff. It's amazing stuff, man. It's amazing it's, stuff. Yeah. You know, and I... Yeah, it's, it has changed me. It's changed me for the better, you know. I've been able to, you know draw on all my strengths and everything from the past and then kind of step back and just see okay there's this huge new world out there in in a way but definitely the sport has helped speed that up because i could be at home stewing and then find out about the sport or whatever two years down the line then i've just wasted two years type thing if that makes sense and um yeah man it's just focus determination let's let's get this going and even if it's only for a short period you know it's 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 sped the process of healing i guess from for me up you know it's like it's been great mm. you know just just open and open indoors as it were mm-hmm. getting that sense of achievement that goals looking forward to things you know it gets annoying at times cycling five days a week and long, long hours and all that. But I know put that work in, it's going to pay off. It's making me stronger physically. Um, it's clearing my head. Just like, you know, when you're stressed out or whatever years ago and you just have to go run, you know, just almost just sprint it all off, you know, go to the gym, hit the bag, whatever type thing and that was that that's what climbing was for me you know that that process that transition out of the military security world whatever um that that transition was probably harder for me than getting a getting a spinal injury in in a way you know it was more frustr more frustrating if you don't it's hard to recognize it as well right yeah no it's hard to recognize it's even happening yeah or there's even a an issue you know, um, I don't want to say, I don't want to say an issue. It's, it's hard, to, hard to see it as a 
this is a difficult period in my life mm-hmm. and what, what the struggles are because it's not obvious that this it's like you said earlier actually you mm-hmm. said the culture shock of going back to Canada in yeah, I've spoken about this a few times recently on air and off air. It's like the cunt, mm-hmm. absolutely fucking. That is a flat out culture shock. Mm-hmm. Even if you'd come out of the Marines and like, yeah, you know, even if you'd been in the Canadian military and come out and then gone back into like Canadian Civvy Street, yeah, that's a culture shock, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it, pe- it's people, wild because it's what you, it's a life you don't lead anymore. You know, you're going into something you don't understand. That, yeah, absolutely. Um, but because you don't have that sort of uh, because it's not a a you know. One day you're climbing, and the next you're in fucking hospital, and it's a, a you know a sw- light switch on on and off. It's a slow stew. It's a slow stew, and particularly where the, the security world is concerned, I had a very similar experience to you. And you know, I mm-hmm. went, I went out, I went at the security world for a few years, absolutely fine, you know. And then it's only when I came back and I started working in the UK, yeah. normal. Shit went Pete Tong, like. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or or the shit that's gone Pete Tong was more obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and like you're like you were kind of saying like you have all this you have all this worth and drive from before, you know. I was back in Canada and I was like, what? Like I just couldn't figure out what was going on with me, you know. I didn't like I didn't recognize something was happening as such, but I was like, okay, you've got all this great stuff behind you. Why is, why is no one recognizing this? You know, like, and then it's just the frustration just boils. And I was like, I cannot figure. And then you go and get trained in something, try to, try to figure out, make some sort of a path for yourself, but there's real, no direction, no clear direction. And I was just like, yeah, stuff it, go and climb in, you know, like whether, you know, climbing was really good for me. I know it chilled me out a lot. But it was almost like I was running away at times from issues, problems, whatever. You know, I was just putting everything on the back burner type thing. But yeah, climbing climbing was really good for me that way. It just aided the transition to being a chilled out chilled out person, you know. But still giving me that focus and drive. Um, you know. Driving yeah. It's, it's switching, switching you off from life. It's switching you off from life. Like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, like you're still getting you a sense of accomplishment your, 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 your and stuff. Everything. But you fo- you focus one hundred percent. What you need to do, like the cycling, like the running. My best days, mate. My my the best when I'm most productive, when I'm soundest in my mind. My best days, one hundred percent, are days where I've done fitness mm-hmm. or. It's the day after I've done fitness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, they are. Well, it's the single most impactful thing that uh, that 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 uh, that that ch- changes my perspective. Not perspective. It changes my mental state. I I don't. Well, I, I don't necessarily mean just fitness. I mean out outdoor stuff. Focus. You know. Yeah. Something that gets me to focus. I have to. I have to do. It. I'm going climbing this weekend actually, and uh, I shit myself. Mind. <laughs> I'm so, this is this is my kids, mate. Just I cack myself, but I, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> Force yourself to do it. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. yeah so, but it's because uh, I've got no choice. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, the, 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 the single most impactful, the impactful days, the best days when I've been in fitness. Yeah. But why is that? I, I mean, one you got you know it releases the pheromones in the body. It makes you feel good. Whether you do like 500 meters, or whether you do like 10 mile, whether yeah. you're cycling or whether you're swimming or whatever. Sense of accomplishment, but also like saying you're switching it off your folks. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely sense of accomplishment. Yeah, and it it can get you out of that rut. You know, you you're stewing in yourself or whatever. You you don't want to leave the house. You're just on the computer, whatever. You know, it's like making that choice. Okay, I'm actually going to get up, put my running sh- running shoes on, and hammer. It. And then you come back and you're like, what has happened? You know, whole s- switch. You know, I'm the same way when I get on the bike type thing Do you have a, sorry go on yeah i was gonna say um with climbing you know it w- it was more than just like that physical output in in a, in a sense you know definitely that sense of accomplishment um working so hard but doing like hard hard routes where where you have to be so switched on so focused and in a big environment 
you know, where there's a lot of outside factors, weather, avalanche, hazards, et cetera, et cetera. You know, where you've, you've got to be so, so switched on and careful, especially if you're a bit remote. But uh, I remember crack climbing, going up this finger crack, so your fingers are just tightly wedged in different, you know, you're just smearing within the crack, the rubber on your shoes. You've got that piece of gear that you've put into the crack as your protection well below you. And I remember being so, so, f I still recall like the feeling and the movement the texture like I still can see the crack when I've climbed and I'm just in this bubble it's just so focused and the only time that I've had that before is when I've been scrapping in Afghan where everything you know where time you know that time slows down and you can see what's you know you can almost step out of your body and you can just see what's going on and just hammer what needs to get done you know what I mean and those, that decision-making process is so clear and focused, even though there's some like serious stakes, whether it be an Afghan or, you know, you're about to fall, you know, 15 feet on a crack climb or whatever. That was like that connection that I loved with climbing. Just kind of, I'm sure people get it with like, you know, a high from a really hard run or maybe even yoga or what, whatever. But that was like, whether I was chasing that or I was really in that moment, that was like where I was just me, it's, in, it's, in a sense. It's pushing the body to, it's, it's the mental state you get from one or two things <clears throat> all both together. And it's pushing the body to the limit of, it, if, of its extremities mm -hmm. in that current state. So you're a couch potato, I can't run another quote and do ten minutes of running or walking, and you fucking find it hard, man. And that, and that, and you, but you're pushing your body. Yeah. A five minute walk or run, something you wouldn't have done before, you know. Mm -hmm. You're pushing your body to the limit, limit of its extremities in that situation. So it's either that, or it's, or it's danger close to death. Yeah. Danger close, and your decisions, right, will will have a uh, will play a major part in whether you survive or you don't. What what um what. What tour were you on in Afghan with uh, the Marines? What tours? Well, it was with the uh, One Para. Oh, so, oh yeah. right, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, you were SFSG, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Did mention that at the start. Yeah. Why not? I don't know. Just Royal Marine, Royal Marine friends. Pay, give, yeah, yeah. Not gonna, be happy with that. How do they look on S SFSG? The bootnecks. I think they just. Yeah, I think they just see it as just part of the core. Oh, you're away, and then you come back. But it's it's different. Different from it's really different. So from you the did a, a, you some short, some like a few short tours with one pair. Yeah, just just the one yeah. one long one. Okay, kind of the six monther, and then I was down there for whereabouts were you? Two and a bit years, all over, all over Helmand. It was yeah, it was great. Just kind of being able to bounce around throughout Helmand and just kind of get a big lay of the land, as it were, and see all the different regiments, units, whatever that we we worked with. Where, wider green army or different coalition forces and stuff so i could i wasn't just i, lo I really liked it because i wasn't just confined to one sort of fob or one ao as it were you know i kind of see a bit of everything doing a wide variety of ops as well was great yeah, kind of so i just got most bang for my buck as it were it's, like, it's an eye opener when you see other other units within the british army and yeah. british forces and but then also like foreign units that mm -hmm. unfortunate to have I haven't had any experience working with loads, you know, but I think more more than your average sort of bloke in a unit, you know, but uh, um, I mean, not operationally, um, but I, I always remember, uh, I always remember you in a story about, I think it was in, it was in 2008, we, we, were, we were based at a calf, and they, I remember there just be, I can't remember the conversation, but there was reference to a Spanish army fob. And it wasn't far from Kandahar, yeah. and it was reference to them being a drama because every every evening when the sun went down, they'd just be on the piss all night <laughs> the, on the on the ground protecting this Ford operating base, and the Spanish would just get on the wine. <laughs> <laughs> you think, oh man, I, uh, I think I think that came from. I'm sure cause I came out of that tour late. I'd come off seniors, and I think one, I think uh, three power had done an op in the vicinity of that fob. Yeah, Spanish just getting on the piss. 
That's and then you, it mental, and then you get other and then you get other forces units where the the caliber of the people part of them are just immense, mm-hmm. but they're just from a shit hole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's Estonians. You know what I mean? Yeah. Estonians, mate. Those people are hardcore. Yeah, but I mean they're like a nineteen forties army. You know, you haven't got the kit, you haven't got the equipment. You think, man, if you if you gave you our kit, you know, gave you our training and. and He's really indestructible. Just machines just <laughs> rolling through the place. Cold weather is not a drama for Estonians. Like. No. <laughs> they don't even have gloves. <laughs> yeah, flipping heck. I was yeah. talking to a guy, um, I was talking to a guy called uh, Ben Langdon, and he's an Australian. And he spent time in, he, 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 Go out, the, go out the mill. He's an Australian Defence Force, one hour. Have you heard of him? Ben Lang? Ben, is ben Lang? No. I've just done a podcast with him. And I can't, I, okay, I've no. got his name wrong twice this morning, <laughs> right? Even though I know his name. Because I've got his name wrong. I keep getting it wrong again. In fact, it was uh, Gaz who introduced me to him. Actually. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so he uh, he got out, went into security in, in Afghan, and he ended up getting, he ended up killing an Afghan. Like, uh, the guy, the Afghan, pulled his weapon. They got into an argument. Yeah. And the... Uh, and the Afghan pulled his pistol, pointed at Gaz, and Gaz just put... Dropped him? Yeah. Four rounds dropped him, point blank into the chest, because the guy was in the vehicle. And then, I don't know, he, like, proper did him. <laughs> proper did him. And then, and then he, it was, he was protecting a convoy, mm-hmm. uh, a, a US Army convoy, um, of, of, like, ISO containers and kit and mail and all that shit, yeah. right? And so they, they cracked on with because they, they were on the ground when it happened. It's like, right, get the convoy moving. He opens the boot of the he opens the boot of the, of the car, and in the boot is just full of drugs. And this guy, this Afghani, was part of the team, and it was like a son of a warlord and all this crap. And yeah, yeah. He says, yeah, going, going. Uh, right, we'll crack on. Get rid of the vehicle, and they go and burn the vehicle with the body in it. And then it's like, right, you try to cover up, you try to cover up <laughs> murder. He spent seven years in prison, Afghan prison, mate. Oh. Yeah, but the reason I bring him up is he, he had a really interesting. You're talking about you know seeing a lot of Afghanistan and, and and different units, different people, and different aspects. And he spent seven years in, in, a, in a prison, and he, he was engaging with the ta- engaging in conversation with Taliban prisoners in there. Yeah, and um, he, he, he to get their insight of what was going on was he said was this it was just like fascinating. It's, fa- it's fascinating, and it made me wonder what what the opinions of different factions were across Afghan with us with us being there. You know, it's it's uh, yeah, it's lots of questions around around that whole campaign that you can ask yourself day and night, never get an answer. I mean, yeah, what what was it like with the different? What was you? How how much was the variation of different communities and and their opinions of sort of that campaign in Afghan? Did you get much an insight into it, or not? Uh, you know, in fact, also a different unit, different military units out there. Yeah, I liked sort of the Afghans we worked with were pretty pretty squared away. And then when I'd watch them engaging in like a little sure or whatever, or even just face to face with like two three locals, I could see, I could see that they actually cared about their country and getting it squared away and moving forward. And the local population, when they were just genuine locals wanting to crack on with their life, witnessing that was pretty cool. And then watching the locals then see that they kind of gave a shit, and then they would just start, you know, giving in or whatever, and then actually just saying, like, we just want to get stuff squared away and just crack on with our lives sort of thing. So watching that was pretty eye-opening. And then even just, you know... Bedouins or whatever that just generally really didn't have a clue as to what was going on. They're just like, yeah, that's happening 50 miles away. We just want to herd our sheep and our goats and get on with it. And then seeing, you know, working with the different units or whatever, mate, just lies just patrolling the same same ground over and over again, you know, not really pushing out really far, whereas we could we had the ability to push quite far out and you know, get the lay of the land and then go and push out far, far and scrap, you know, and then just go into these places where the Taliban or whatever is, you know, 
they've just got free reign of the place. They're they're able to set up, facilitate IEDs and all that, and then push into the where the lads are patrolling and stuff, and you know just kind of have free reign. So I was there in 2010. It seemed like there was a lot of restrictions, you know, rules of engagement and that. Um, witnessing that was pretty, pretty tough. Just watching the the lads just in the fobs or checkpoints or whatever, like just restricted when, you know, engaging someone who's potentially has an ID or whatever, you know, just like hands off kind of thing. I actually remember pulling into this fob. I can't remember where it was. And as soon as we pulled in, the place got hit pretty hard, pretty, pretty heavy rate of fire. So all of our lads and some of theirs up on the Hesco, up in the Sangers, getting rounds down, trying to figure out what's going on. You know, that quieted down. And it, it continued for like a couple of days before we put it in an op or whatever. But I remember their OC or C or whatever it was didn't want all of our us lads getting on the Hesco, getting the rounds down when, when they started getting incoming and stuff. Just no why, why is that? I have no idea. They're like just snipers, just sharpshooters, you know, we don't wanna, you know, piss the locals off sort of thing. You know, that that sort of thing. And I was witnessing that and I was just like This think- is this is this is kinda kinda crazy kinda crazy, you know. I just I couldn't wrap my head around it. You know, obviously you can't be out there and just pushing and being like turbo aggressive and stuff in a way but you kind of have to be to stay safe yeah i can understand the pissing the locals off sentiment but then it's <coughs> where's your faith in the troops you know i mean well i'm very uh i'm very happy you hear stories of like collateral damage and people just fucking brassing shit up for the sake of brassing shit up mate you know mm-hmm. and uh i'm very i'm very very lucky i think I think I'm. I think I'm lucky because it, it sounds like there's stuff going on elsewhere. But in my experience, <coughs> I think I'm fortunate. That, fortunate that I didn't ever experience that. You know, uh, no, I tell a lie. I did once. I tell a lie. I did once. Um, but it, it, for the majority, of it, I didn't experience. Like I said, brass and shit up for the sake of brass and shit up. I mean, for, for myself, you know, it's like I, I wouldn't go engage in some a uh, building. Or a person, unless I was a hundred percent sure there was a reason to engage, as yeah. a valid reason, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I knew that it wasn't going to be. Um, no, well, I knew not that I knew. You can never know hundred percent, but I, or, or the estimate I had said is there going to be no, you know, sieve pop in there. Um, and the same with you know calling in air and and the mortars and and all that and using flipping, you know, your 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 missile launchers and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean the one the one incident I did experience and pissed me off, man. Really, and it's it stuck with me for well, it stuck with me till now. Talking about now, and uh, it was in uh, I was in Kajaki in it's two thousand six, and uh, there was a person who was attached to the unit, and um, he was a TA guy, and he was out there. He, he seemed like a nice guy. He's a bit of a fucking pest. You know what I mean? He could draw. I could saw him do it. He could draw an Enfield rifle from his memory, and it was just picture perfect on the sketch pad. You go, yeah. yeah. And all the inner workings, and he's right, freak. Real. And he, you know, he, he, he always volunteered. Apparently, he always volunteered himself for every tour. You know, one of these guys, great TA, wanted to get on the yeah. ground, you know, and, uh, and and do the stuff. But he's also responsible for airstrikes <coughs> and, uh, and and things like that. And mm. um, and he was very fond of. At any opportunity he'd call in and he'd call drop, in yeah. whether he, whether it was necessary or not you know uh, whether it was the right thing sometimes it, it it's it's an option a valid mm-hmm. option but there's stuff below that you know the escalation of force there's stuff below that yeah, you can yeah. do to you know to, you may not you may not even need to do anything to do with that ammunition you could you know, some other option to try and you know deny the deny the um, the threat or stop the threat and he it was um, this incident it was a they they reckoned that um when I say they in the company they reckoned that uh, they thought there was an enemy fighter had gone into this building and uh, I happened to be off the OP and back at the HQ I can't remember what I was down there for and so sniper got my optics out you know and uh, 
got down and I started observing for them. And there was nothing. There was no one in there. I was guy. I'm convinced there was nothing. There was no threat. Yeah. There was no one in that building. No, I, there was. I wasn't seeing what they had reported. It was like that. There was nothing. There was no one there. And he called in a fucking airstrike on this. Uh, it was a, a five, uh, I think it was a thousand pounder, thousand pound fucking bomb dropped on this building, mate. And I, and I couldn't believe he was doing it. I, I, I didn't think there was anyone in there. So it's like, what you, you know, so we're screaming like a building blowing up. What the fuck are you doing, man? Yeah. You know, there's nothing there. There's nothing. It's, and it, it was back and forth on the radio going, and he was adamant. No, no, no. It's ignoring what I was saying. Bearing in mind he had a pair of times seven magnification fucking binoculars and we look at their target about a K and a half away. And I've got a times 40. Right? Yeah. <laughs> He's just, see you know, straight like through just, it. He just, exactly. He just wanted to call it in and he called in his fucking airstrike. Pissed me off. And the worst thing about it was, was after, the, after, the, uh, after the arms were dropped, uh, after the munitions were dropped and you went for it to impact, I can't, remember what they, I can't remember what the length of time was from the munitions being dropped from the plane to them, uh, to them striking. Uh, to a thousand pounder strike him, but there was a a guy, a literally because there's civvies about, man, yeah, and in that area at the time, and the civvy literally with a couple of shopping bags, walking down the path towards this building, and the the fucking the thousand pounder hit, and poof, he wasn't at the building, and poof, and, mate, if you're within about well, you know, yeah, if yeah. you're within probably two hundred meters of a thousand pounder going off, mate. You are not going to be the same person you were yeah, no. after that bomb goes off. You yeah. are fucked. And You're the, done. And the dust cloud disappeared. The mushroom went up. Dust cloud disappeared. And this guy just laid on the floor. You know, it's like what the fuck, man. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't yeah. believe that. It's the only time I experienced it. You know, and and, and uh, you get those people. Unfortunately, you get those yeah. people. Unfortunately, what, what 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 can you do about it? I mean, go, <coughs> this can't be air because you come back to that the commander with the you know where's your faith in your troops. <coughs> It strikes me, mate. If he's not letting people get on the wall to like repel a, an attack, maybe it was a really light attack, right? Yeah. You want, you want it over pretty quick. If you got the option there, use it. But he must have had an incident. Must, have, must they must have had like incidents of people not giving a fuck or civvies getting killed and pissed off the locals. Some there must have been some ill discipline somewhere. I would yeah. suggest, or he just did. Or he was just a flapper. I, I think, yeah. Who knows? Flapper probably. You know, there's like. 150 meters away there's Taliban flags flying on compounds and it's just like you know what I mean this is a we did a lot of scrapping in there it's just you know kind of these incidences were that were you know I just couldn't wrap my head around Can it you remember the what the area was out of interest no I can't remember at all I can't remember who was working out of there but you know it's like it's crazy because you would see lads or the lads you know getting a scrap maybe a local would get injured or maybe there's just somebody injured you know just the way life is and lads would work so hard to try to help that person out. You know, even if something, you know, even if a contact happens and there's an injured kid or something, you know, they're working so hard. Oh, civvies, you mean? Civvies, yeah, yeah to help them out. No ma- you know, like they're just <clears throat> driven to do that. It's, it's crazy to see, you know. But then I was also lucky to go into areas where there was like no IED threat and it was just, you know, getting in a good old fashioned gunfight. You know, it's just like, Gloves are off. They want to scrap. We want to scrap. Let's do it. And that was, it was like, it was good. They're the best ones, aren't they? Kind of, kind of old, <laughs> kind of old best. school, right? <laughs> They're yeah. the best ones. Like, Two thousand mm-hmm. six was more or less old. Was more or less old. Like, I was just like fucking hell. Yeah. yeah and uh, and but you know, like, yeah, the, the problem became. The problem became moving down the line. Like, you, you know, the, the Taliban started changing their tactics to more ID based because they were they were. Yeah, you know, we just smash them. Yeah, you know, engage with the small arms. You're gonna get, you're gonna get done over. Gonna get hammered quick. So they move towards IEDs and, and indirect weapons. <coughs> yeah, and uh, and so we had to change our tactics. I say we, I mean the British, you know, British mm-hmm. Americans, have to change our tactics and the way we're operating. But at the same time, the public, the public percept. So we were trying to change the tactics to meet what what was needed to to the fight the enemy. But at the same time, the, because of not public perception, but public pressure i think man we was hands are so tidy our we got tight the rules of engagement got tighter yeah the protective measures that were taken to protect us were just too they were just crazy man putting I mean, a huge amount of kits yeah, on like i, I mean <clears throat> and you can't knock civvies for not understanding like you yeah, can't no no, you no. Don't understand. and obviously there's a lot of misrepresentation of information that goes on you know like uh mm-hmm. but i mean i remember on that 06 top mate there was We'd get the option as we got given the options, commanders. Do you are you going to wear body armor or not on this op? Offensive op, 
Are you going to yeah. wear body armor or not? If it's defensive, you can wear it, right? Not offensive operation. You're going to wear body armor or not? You go, no thanks. Bin it. Bin the body armor. Or why, why you would you do it? Because Speed and aggression, man. Exactly, mate. Speed and aggression. I, I wasn't. I wasn't aggression. I was, yeah. I was, I was a chalk aggression for me, but yeah, speed and aggression. Because you're fighting people, right? Who are in flip flops, dish dashes. They got a couple of mags, a few mags around them, yeah, and an AK forty seven. You know, and they had the opportunity because they live where you're fighting them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, and then as time goes on, as time went on, like you said, the body armor got bigger, the plates got bigger, it became clunk. It made you can hardly move in some of the stuff. And as a sniper, you could even get to a proper fucking fire position in some of the body armor. You couldn't yeah. lay down properly. You couldn't Probably get wet up, in the shoulder. Yeah. It's like, and then, and then you become less accurate. You know, as a, as a result, it's like. All these things have a, have a huge, huge impact of the civvies. I understand it, but again, go back to civic perception. I remember going on. To, uh, I remember going on to a. Uh, I remember going on to a inquest after that tour for um, one of the guys who got killed, and he'd been killed by uh, an e- explosive incident. And I mean, I don't want. I don't want to give specifics because I don't want to. Yeah. Because the, the parents are still alive, right? And in the inquest, the the the, the mother. Um, spent a significant period of time asking why, why there wasn't ballistic protection available to cover the whole of the body. She was on about plates, you know. You know, you mm-hmm. know back in those days, you have a plate that cover your heart, and then you get a plate that cover your chest. And she wanted, to, she couldn't understand why we couldn't have full body protective suit that stopped bullets. You know, and and you, you know, you laugh about it. Yeah, that, but that's but where that is the, you, they don't gun. understand. Yeah, you know. They, but what happens is that is an example of what happens then when you go out there a few years down the line and a few years after that, and just crazy amounts of body armor. Your helmet's changed; it's heavier. You got to wear fucking gloves. You got to wear those crazy mm-hmm. underpants. Remember the boxes? Did you I get never, those? I never wore them. Oh like, my tuck god! Tuck up underneath. Yeah, thunderpants, ballistic protection underwear. You know, it's like okay. And it stopped to stop uh, fragmentation from explosives, like hitting your your, your, your nether regions. Well, that's great, but they're heavy. They make you sweat. They give it more prone to like in um uh, like chafing and infection. And, and, yeah, just, great. You're stopping. You, you're preventing us getting injuries in that in one way, but you're actually you're in another down, way, we're you're exposing target. us more. Exposing yeah. us more. We move slower. We can't take the fight to the enemy. The enemy afforded more freedom of movement around your base. And, um, trickle it, the trickle it, down effect is just. I I'm a big believer in in it should be back to minimal body armor, or you give the option. Mm-hmm. You go okay. You should, well, you, can, you can have no body armor, or you can have your CBA. You know the old like that old. Yeah, yeah. I suppose if you look at it like a flak vest, or you got your osprey and all that eleven and that. You, there's there's your options. You choose what you need to achieve the end. Yeah. And and depends come on, what make, you're doing and where you go. You got it in a high ID threat area. I'm sticking all my shit on, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah or, or depending on what op you're doing, but you give yeah. the option to the the, the uh, you give the option to the commanders to the different units, and I think well, well, we would we would we would be so much more capable of fighting force. Yeah. You can't do that, can you? Yeah, you it was. Wouldn't wash. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was just. It was crazy just to see see all this unfolding, uh, witnessing it, and then, you know, but I had a, I had a great time. You know, having all these different types of ops and different roles, and just get, like I said, getting the lay of the land, and being able, to, you know, probably got the best of best of every world there. Afghan food as well. I loved oh, it. I yeah, love Afghan food. Man. Yeah, what was that like? Weird milky bread where they put like tobacco on top or something? What? Or not? Where mil- were you? Not, <laughs> not not milky bread. The, it's like this weird like milk in a bowl, and they dip the bread into it. I don't remember that. Yeah, it was I weird. Don't know. And they got sprinkle some green stuff on top. I don't know what it was. Oh, someone will someone will listen to this and they'll reply and they'll say, and when I, yeah. when I, when it'll be online yeah. on social media when they do. I remember like sitting area. around, drink, sorry, sing, sitting around just drinking it and like, oh, what am I going to catch here? Here you go, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Remember that. Yeah. Talk to me about the cycling, mate. So, um, uh, how many miles are you doing a day or a week? How many? So uh, training wise. <laughs> Training, training, Talk through it. training wise, it, it all varies depending where I am in uh, the training period, right? So, what adventure especially? Start with so yeah, so uh, hand cycling. So it's basically a r- r- but distance. I mean, oh, distance. Sorry, yeah. uh, what during race? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So we do individual time trial. So over fifteen to twenty k usually, usually around sixteen, seventeen k. 
Uh, so it's out and back. And then a road race can be up to about 40 plus kind of thing. So those are the two uh, distances for the two races that I do type thing. Um, so it's full on training, training with that. So the week before I came in four days, I did 11 hours on the bike with two. Yeah, that was over four days with two strength days. Like gym days. Yeah. Strength, strength and conditioning, yeah, yeah. mobility. Um, yeah, just getting jacked, trying to, <laughs> yeah, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of work on the bike. So, um, in that four days I did two sort of power workouts, you know, sprints and that sort of thing, trying to hold as much power as I can over a two minute period, one minute period, you know, just doing repeats like that. So everything in cycling is measured by power. What do you mean? Go on. Wattage. So, so what's, the, what's the calculation? I don't, I don't have no is idea. Is it speed versus, there is a power calculation, isn't it? What, is, what is it, speed versus? I have no idea. I don't know. We'll have to find out. Mate, they were just like, get on the bike and cycle, and it's like, sweet. <laughs> oh, it tells you on it, the wattage? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. So, yeah, um, on my bike, there's a little power meter in the hub of the front wheel. So on the screen on my bike, on the little bike cycling computer, I can see how how fast I'm going, how long I've gone, my heart rate, my power, wattage, elevate, everything is getting fed back to me. So I'll have a workout and I'll have it memorized and then I can just go do hill repeats or whatever sort of thing, as it were. You're trying to hit those targets on the... Uh, yeah, trying to hold it, depending on what workout I'm doing. And then say on an endurance ride, it might be three, three and a half hours long. And I just hit the hit the roads just get out get out on the roads and for that i might average say 25 kilometers an hour with a couple maybe a couple thousand feet of elevation depending where i go what route i do that's rapid so yeah. on the on the hand on the hand cycling yeah is that it, so it's an even it's an even push pull it's an even push pull and it's in front of you yeah so there's two wheels in the back one wheel in the front i'm laying down i'm really low even push pull the gearing is the same as a regular road bike except for it's backwards and upside down in a way yeah and i can just there's lots of different variations but i just shift with my fingers type thing change the gears for climbing or going fast fastest i've ever gone down a hill uh long hill was 97 kilometers an hour <laughs> <laughs> yeah where was that in the mountains so um, actually 11 months, 11 months after my injury, I wanted to get back and push myself sort of thing. And I'd only trained indoor. So when it's winter or can't go outside, you train on an indoor trainer. And obviously Canada in winter, you can't go in anywhere. So I spent a lot of time just on an indoor trainer staring at the wall, you know. So uh, I'd only been outside a few times, been on the trainer a few times. And I got back into the mountains, um, kind of along this, they call it the Icefields Parkway. Beautiful. Icefields Parkway. Yeah. Yep. So between Jasper and Lake Louise, two big touristy kind of areas. Huge mountains. Did a lot of climbing in there, a lot of ice climbing. And uh, I wanted to get back, get back in there, try to push myself. Managed to get out 150 kilometers in a push. Started in the rain, turned to snow, eventually got into sun. You know, it was just wild. Yeah, I can't remember how many hours. It was probably like 12 hours. I was going so slow. It's like my third time ever on a road. But, you know, I was going past like these mountains I'd climbed and, you know, seeing them and ones I wanted to climb, you know. But, yeah, it was like that just physical draining, mentally draining. But that's, I hit a huge downhill. There's a lot of, a lot of big downhill flipping mountain pass, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, hit 97. I was just watching the speed just go up, go up, go up. And I was just... I was just like, oh, this is mental, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. It was wild. Just yeah. in the middle of a road, just, you know, the pavement's just shooting past you and just... Canada must be the place to cycle if you're going to cycle <clears throat> or do anything, I think. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Just, yeah. just beautiful. Full of lunatics, though. You're a bit different than the Americans, aren't you? Yeah, a little more chilled. But b- b- weirder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to watch Def- out, mate. Definitely. Trump might be after buying you. Ooh. Greenland's like doesn't look like Greenland's happening for him. Oh, is he wanted uh, wanted to snag up Greenland? The news. No, I think I saw a soundbite of it. He said he wants to buy. Can- he said he he's into he's 
He's not expecting me. He's <laughs> gone <laughs> off track here, but he said no, something good. like, um, uh, it, he would consider it an option. It, it, it would be, <laughs> he would be up for discussing buying Greenland. And then it was like, he, there was a bit of gags. People were thinking he was joking. And then, and then, and then they've turned Denmark around and said, no fucking way, Jose. And he's cancelled a trip he was meant to be having in Denmark because they, they turned around and said, no, not happening. We don't want to cancel a trip to you then. So he's, yeah. he's like <laughs> semi serious, mate. He's, mental. he's just buy playing Greenland, the game. Just like, Greenland, let's, yeah. let's see Go what we can Greenland, do with this. Yeah, yeah flipping egg. It's funny. <laughs> Yeah, have you ever been to Canada? No, I've not. No, I mean, I, I might, I might be going for work in the mm-hmm. not too distant future. Gotcha. Maybe, which would be good. But it, it, uh, it does strike me a bit like a, a slightly more populated version of Greenland. I mean, I was, yeah. I was looking around like the Newfoundland Labrador area. Beautiful. And yeah, and the places uh, I'd be going to are in the middle of nowhere. And you look, and there's like Inuit settlements, mate, Eskimos, <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> It's yeah, proper it's, crazy. Yeah, most of our population is kind of towards the, towards the south, kind of not too far from the American border, type thing, you know. And then you, you know, huge patches of nothing. Yeah, just nothing. And then yeah, little settlements here. What's and there the population are, in Canada? I haven't a clue. I wonder what it is. I haven't a clue. Probably I, I, the population. I wonder what it is per like. It'd be interesting to see what, what the population of Canada is per. Per square mile, like per capita, whatever yeah, they call it. Yeah, if you were like going to spread everyone out and yeah, how much like space they would have. One and a half people per K or something. Yeah. Shed loads of elk. Probably 10K. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How come, um, how come you went back to Canada and didn't stay in the UK? In fact, how were you eligible for the Royal Marines? Part of the Commonwealth. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's me being a moron. No, it's all good. <laughs> Sorry, man. Sorry, yeah. 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 So it was pretty, yeah, you know. There was a few Canadians knocking about when I was in. I served with a Canadian. Okay, yeah. Um, in three parts. Uh, Baz Barrett, Ian okay. Barrett, Ian, Ian Barrett. He's still serving. Still in. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's I always found it quite random. You know, some some lads had There's a someone else as well. Go on, someone else as well. Yeah, some lads had like a connection. You know, they had a grandparent or maybe their mum or whatever was from the UK. But there was a couple like me that had zero connection, and they just wanted to just get after that adventure or, you know get on ops right away or something i don't know or just you know the difficulty of training of either joining the paras or royal marines you know it's something a little bit more than what canada has to offer type thing what was the biggest you mentioned earlier the culture shock of coming across from the uk uh, canada into the uk and joining the boot of joining the marines what was what was what sticks out in your mind is the biggest like whoa what this was this this place is a bit different yeah, you came across. First coming across was, you know, riding the train into London and just seeing how packed in everything was, you know. And then I was like, <laughs> I remember, I remember going on the underground and I was just like people coming in and out and barging around. And I was like, how do more people not get shot here? <laughs> you know, I remember thinking that. And then, and then getting the train up to Lim, <laughs> you know, I was like, I just couldn't fathom it, you know. <laughs> getting the train up to Limston and I remember there was two Scottish guys on there. I I still don't know what they were talking about, mate. And then I, and then I started talking to like, <laughs> you know, scousers and stuff. I was just, what the heck is it? You know, and then other people from around the country. I'm just like, I cannot, I don't know what anyone's saying, you know? And then they've all got their own like little language and their, you know, their little, their own little sayings and stuff. So I couldn't figure that out. Plus all like the bootneck slang and stuff. I couldn't figure that out. And which one was, you know, it was just like, it was madness. I still have times now. I still have, t- <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> I think it's a product of being around loads of different places in, in, in my yeah. life and learning different languages and recognizing, you know, all the different Arabic languages and, yeah. you know, and flipping all sorts. And I still have times now, what happened last week, right, where someone will come, because the other thing is, I, I work in London, right? Yeah. The other thing is, you, you, you go in, when you when I go there, you have to be in a mindset that not everyone speaks your flipping language. Especially, the, I work for Inmarsat, mate. Yeah, they got like in the office in London, they got like seventy odd different nationalities working for them in London. So you just and they and they quite happy to speak their own language between you know French ladies, French bloke, well, not just French ladies, French bloke. Well, and if they're talking to each other and speak the same language, they'll speak to each other in that language. Sometimes, the other times they want it depends. So I'm all, my mind's always on when some and I'm like partially deaf as well. So my hearing is not great anyway. So someone speaks to me. I've had it last week, and it's got. And I think, fuck, you know, what, what, what? They, so I don't, I don't. I 
speak I don't speak I speak English. And it's happened where someone's speaking in a crazy English accent, like a Geordie or yeah, Brummy yeah. or Jock. And I used to, I've got friends in it like you are. Yeah. You've got friends with them all. But sometimes if they like if it's particularly strong, I have not got a clue yeah. what is going on. And fast, they're just going and the so sayings, fast. And the sayings, they've got a Geordie mate. Or oh, is he Geordie or is he Mackham? Can't which one he's from. He's, yeah. Anyway, so he he said one day, he said, uh, fancy a buckle of bait, mate? Fancy that's not even the Geordie accent. He said he basically said, Do you fancy a buckle of bait? I said, Fancy a buckle of bait? What? Fancy a buckle of bait? What are you on about? What are you on about? <laughs> and it means do you fancy going for a pint? <laughs> oh man, what are you talking about? I've never even heard that. I, went, what? I, mean, I couldn't even <laughs> decipher that. <laughs> fancy buckle of bait. <laughs> Fucking buckle of bait. Mental. Just Mental. Absolutely yeah. random. Yeah. This is wild. That's good though. I do I do like I do like diversity. It's a lot that you said for it, mate. It's so it's such a benefit. It is in the right aspect. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. It's just you learn so much, you know, and 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 that's one of the beauties of the like being military side. Yeah. My God. The thing like the things we you know, experience just, just in a culture perspective. Yeah. Like you were saying, that bowl of the bowl of milky stuff with the bread, whatever it is, with the yeah. tobacco, <laughs> whatever it yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. You know, my my best meal I've ever had that sticks in my mind is the best meal I've ever had is is in Afghan. I was sat there and I was in Ashura. Was it Ashura? No, it wasn't Ashura. It was a, just sat there with a the meeting. There was a what was the meeting? What the fuck am I talking about? It was a, sat there having dinner with um, the local police unit. Yeah, and they served goat on the spine. Goat, so goat spine with a meat pack around it, right? Yeah, and sour milk, and it was like a bowl of chilies, and it was naan bread. Oh my god, I've never t- and it's basic, that's basic, you know, basic stuff, simple, yeah. Goat meat, milk, not the most amazing thing I've ever tasted. It was just oh, honest to god, yeah, honest to god. I mean, yeah, you just you know, and then going into the security world or whatever as well, you know, it's just like you're just seeing things you would never imagine, couldn't imagine, and you know, dipping your toe into all these different areas and different cultures and people and actually having like a real genuine interaction with them. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. Like, do you have national service in Canada? No, no. What do you think of the concept? I think it's great. I really do. Um, whether it's military service or something that kind of serves people, you know, if you're, if you're not military minded or, you know, have some objecting objection to it or whatever. But if there's some sort of community role, you know, in in a way, you know, and I, I think about it because, you know, I'm kind of more that minded as I think a lot of people, especially young, they're really direct directionless. You know, they come, they come out of school, some are pretty switched on, but they come out of school and it's like, what am I living for? You know. Do you reckon they asked that question? Part of me. Do you think that? Well, they think that that's a question in their mind. But what's the yeah? So what's the point? I don't. I don't. I don't really think. I don't know if it comes up in their head, but I don't know. That's just the sense I get. Because I was definitely that way. Maybe it was just me. Definitely that way when I was younger, like sixteen, seventeen. On I was like, well, I quit school as well. <laughs> you know, I was a little, little, little bugger, but. You know, I was just like, what am I gonna what am I gonna do? You know, I was always adventurous and stuff. So I had a bit of drive and stuff. You know, but it's like I don't know. I, I It's inter- lot- it's interesting that you it's interesting that <coughs> I it's interesting what you said somebody said that actually. In that um you could give the you could give the option to do something other than the military but it serves people. I'd not thought of that before. Because when I when I've national service has been on my head for a while. And I've always, I always felt, especially when I serve, it's like, no, no way. Because if you have national service, then you got, basically you've got, you, you, the standard of the British forces would, would come down. Mm-hmm. Because on average, the, the, the motivation and the capability of, of, of the average um, service person would come down. Yep. Because essentially, there's going to be people that are forced into it and they don't want to do it. And so in general, it's going to come down. But then, <coughs> I think, <clears throat> and now I'm of the opinion. I think that it, on a on a on a broader scale, the, the sort of the the combined uh, the combined uh, positive impact that I would have on 
the UK or whatever country it is, yeah. would would be huge. It would be worth like dropping the standards of the British forces slightly just because you've got more people who aren't interested in being there. there. But to have that, to have a nation of people who have experienced that physical, mental hardship. Mm-hmm. They've experienced, they may, well, may not have experienced a tour. Yeah, they, no. They've experienced depending on people depend, and people having to depend on you and pressure and, you know, and having to motivate yourself and being forced to do things you you don't want to and you to do and you also find uncomfortable. I think, imagine, imagine you know, imagine having a, imagine the generation below us with the first international service. You know, they, they, they. I'd be looking at them in a different light, and they'd be have much better capabilities. I think, and they'd be much yeah. more tapped into what the world is really about, and what and mm-hmm. how people operate, and what what the value, what your value should be. I think. I don't know. That's, that's where I'm going with it now. You know, in, I think. Um you know, imp- implementing or, you know, getting them to get that self-discipline, even that, even that aspect, you know. Um, Understanding you know, yourself. Yeah, push, you know, you know, and they don't have to go get flipping beasted or whatever, you know what I mean? But, you know, just giving them that little bit more, more of a kick. Imagine type, just type doing, thing. imagine just having everyone do like phase one, phase one training. What's yep. that? Just six months, is it? Four months, five months? Billy, six, Billy basis. Imagine just doing that. Even just that would have a massive impact. Yeah, even that would have a massive impact because yeah, the, the or growth. because of all the things we just said. Right? Yeah, you know, I think I think and uh, you know, giving them like more of a cohesive bond within the country, as as it were, if that makes sense, mm. sort of thing. Like you know, we've we've shared something together. You know, I I know the people around me have sh- have shared something together. Whether whether it's that short military service, whatever it is, or helping people out you know you know what i mean and i think it would benefit yeah i think it would benefit a, a lot of people and then it would also benefit the wider community you know mm. whether it's like i don't know <laughs> cleaning stuff up or you know volunteering well volunteering at old folks home you know just spreading the love yeah that's what i liked about that is serving serving people like some so, some sort of service, you know. I mean, you don't know, it's not it's not it's not stuff you only get from the military, like you're saying. No, it's some sort of service. I mean, the hardship has a lot to speak, a lot to say for it. When I was uh, so I went to um, Mozambique with Team Rubicon, yeah, and uh, there was a guy there, and he, the person he was, Sibby, right? He was a Sibby, and the person he was at the end of that that deployment. He did about a week longer than me, I think. He did four weeks, maybe. <clears throat> and the person he was at the end of the deployment was not the person he was at the start. Was not. Yeah. And it was only subtle changes, but a big impact. Like, mm-hmm. much more confident in himself. You know, he he was a la- he sp- <coughs> spoke a bit louder. He was he sort of he also had a different place in our in 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 our little sort of group of friends and teams. His status changed. You know, elevated it's like not yeah. that he was. A moron when he started, but he yep. went up a notch because he's like you get experience. He'd done things with us. He, he's part of the team. He'd experienced hardship. He's a grafter, you know, and all those things helped elevate him mentally to to be a different person. A young lad, mate, young lad, you know, and 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 uh, and it goes back to that that impact of hardship. One hardship and being being part of a team. Yeah, being and if team. if you if you noticed those subtle changes in the short period that you were with him weeks mate yeah weeks. when he goes back to say his wider community his family his whatever you know that can be a big impact imagine the people if, that have never experienced like being part of a, a, a sports team mate there's people you know it's kids now mate yeah couch all their life never been part of a sports team they don't do anything at school you know they, they don't literally have nothing they've no experience like that the real no. stuff the stuff that the stuff that connects you and me you know like makes me want to talk to you i don't mean on the podcast in general yeah. I mean, the stuff that gives you value in my eyes you know what i mean you know and, and vice yeah. versa and generally speaking you know the stuff that elevates your status because that's an important thing you know, status. You know, I'm not saying like you're going to be the fucking president or you know yeah. whatever, but you, your status is an important thing. You get, you get your places. You know, you find out where you you find out about yourself, where you fit in. You also have a respect 
for sort of that status or whatever and where you can fit in where you can help out where you can contribute when you can take over and take charge and start figuring figuring things out yeah. and who you can go to when you need help you know it's not just yeah just exactly. a sea I, of <coughs> individuals you know, I floating around I, I didn't mean uh just to clarify for my, myself you know, Saturday, people I don't mean like um, mm. oh professional or he's he's this or she's like the best or whatever. I mean yeah, yeah. the the little impacts, you know, like you're saying yeah. there. If I if my status within my social group or a circle of my friends is, and I mean my status to them is like, you know, uh, I'm maybe I'm approachable and they can speak to me or they can ask me to do something. They can rely on me to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, those little tiny like basic basic fucking things. Then that's that's good for them and it's good for me. But you don't you don't understand the value of those little things like being honest, admitting your mistakes, and all, all that stuff. You don't understand the value of that unless you've experienced a, a, a need for it to rise in the first place. Mm. Like your sports teams, like 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 going out and being part of you know good do, being do good in like a, in, a, in an old people's home, like you were saying. Yeah, just something. Mm-hmm. Mm, I don't know where we're going with that. I don't know national service. You're just slagging off kids again. Yeah, just slagging off kids. Like PlayStation generation. generation forget yeah, about PlayStation them. PlayStation generation, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we're gonna start. <laughs> what have we done? Look at that, Aaron Jenny. Um, what's uh, what's your, when's your next competition? I've got one. I think when I get back, uh, a couple of weeks time, and then that that'll be it. And then I'll be kind of into the winter phase of training. Should have a uh, another training camp around December, and then March April time I'll have another training camp. So it's when, just, when's your next speaking engagement? You got one lined up. Uh, you're doing after dinner speaking. You're doing motivational speaking, now, aren't you? It's kind of the thing, yeah. Uh, next one that's like fully in the pipeline is October. Oh, cool. Type thing, yeah. How many have you done now? A handful. Well, maybe a dozen or so type thing. So yeah, I've just pretty much started that. Really uh, putting it into like a business now. It's kind of done drips and drabs and kind of started toying with the idea ages ago. This is, something, but it's just kind of fell into place. So I decided, yeah, I'm going to pick on this and just let's see where this takes me. And, you know, give me that drive and goal. You know, I've never done this sort of thing before. You know, just doing fizz, living out of the back of a truck, going climbing. You know, so this is a whole new aspect to my reality, as it were. Setting up a business, doing a bit, you know, because it is a business. And then also being able to add value to a client as it were or whoever I'm speaking to and trying to slot in if an organization is having some sort of trouble within it or needs you know how do I adapt my st- story into that yeah. and help them out and you know well it's unique experiences right I mean <clears throat> but not everyone I'm gobbing off about national service mm-hmm. and going and fucking like Mozambique and, and all this and getting off the couch and doing whatever a lot of people don't have don't have the opportunity to do that time mm-hmm. resources just don't have the opportunity and and with people like yourself with your unique experiences and, and your background if they have if they have got the opportunity to go out and get those experiences themselves that's what it, that's what they learn from it and that's why that's why they're called motivational talks you know yeah. people hear your story your background with the marines and then getting paralyzed and then getting through that and and where you are now and it's it's, it's fascinating mate. it's fascinating it fascinates yeah. me because i i you know i i dread to think whether i'd have you know, be able to be the kind of person you are, and get and and just stay motivated. And I I don't know why that is. I just it's so you, people like you, I find admirable. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, we we're gonna have to start wrapping up. But how can uh how can people get older? Yeah, yeah so they can go to my website, joshuapellan dot com. P e l l a n d. Yeah, yeah. And then from there, I've got a couple of social links. Uh. Yeah, just get in touch with me through Do you there. post your race results on there? No, I'm too slow. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let's let me know how you get on at the next race. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, from there, you can go to my social links and kind of see what I've been up to and what I'm doing. Cool. Anything else you want to mention before we knock on the head? Yeah, just like I'm really only here today because of my family helping me out. You know, the lads coming in and just being being that motivation for me and being strong support network. And seeing all the things that they're doing now, you know, it's like, okay, I can get going, I can get moving. And then the people I interact with in sort of the cycling community or whatever, 
that motivates me. So huge thanks to them. Thanks to you for having me on and your listeners for listening. Anytime, mate. It's been a pleasure. Absolute awesome. pleasure. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, mate.